Uh, well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to come this afternoon to hear the defense of Natalie Blaine's dissertation. Um, we would like, she's just unlocking that door so people can just slip Lock in. Us in. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <right here. laughs> um, what, what will happen here today is Natalie's going to give us about a 35 to 40 minute presentation of her document. Um, we will have questions from the committee. If there's time, we may take some questions from the floor, but perhaps if there isn't time, we won't be able to do that. Um, once that is all completed, then um, we'll ask everyone to leave so that the committee can talk, and then we'll ask Natalie to come up again at that point. So that's the process. Um, she is videotaping, and we had some discussion in the department. She, at her request, she's videotaping, so some people that couldn't attend can see it. She is only going to videotape the presentation part. Once the question and answers begin, the exam portion of it, then the camera will go off. So that's kind of what we decided between the graduate office and the music ed department. This is probably a, a fair way to do that. So welcome, and Natalie, you're on. Thank you for being here. Well, before I get started, I want to thank my committee members, and specifically, most of all, to Dr. May, especially this final push the last four or five <laughs> days, helping me find errors large and small and getting them fixed in a timely manner and also to Dr. Madura, Dr. Walsh, and Dr. Brenner for their words of encouragement, their support, and, and great feedback throughout this process. The title of my project is An Analysis and Description of Female Jazz Instrumentalists. And uh, I belong to the group that I've studied. And it was over the course of my experiences as a jazz major and undergraduate and my master's studies as well as conducting research projects all the way throughout my schooling, that I noticed how jazz studies courses and texts tend to focus mostly on male instrumentalists. I'm kind of leaving an impression that female jazz instrumentalists are few and far between if they even really existed. Uh, and the contributions of female jazz instrumentalists have largely been ignored. So I wanted to investigate the reality of this issue and talk to other women who, like me, have chosen to uh, who have chosen to pursue jazz as their instrumental major in college. And I devised this statement of the problem. It is evident that a small number of women pursue jazz as a collegiate major, even though increasingly women are being recognized for their achievements in and contributions to jazz. While research on sex and participation in instrumental jazz performance exists, there is limited systematic research examining the factors that contribute to a woman's decision to pursue a degree in instrumental jazz performance. It was the purpose of this mixed method study to investigate women who have chosen to pursue or who are currently pursuing instrumental jazz performance as their college major. My four research questions came out of the literature and you do have a complete list of all my resources at the back of your handout available by this back door. Uh, the list of my questions came from unanswered questions in the literature or extensions that I wanted to make on what already exists. Those four questions were, what is the nature of the female jazz instrumentalist experience? To what extent do women express self-efficacy in jazz performance? What are women's attitudes towards jazz improvisation and being in the jazz field? And the fourth question, what are some of the common personality traits of collegiate female jazz instrumentalists? I will briefly go through some of the more important studies that I looked at. In general, I looked at a ton of different studies, ranging from studies on musicians' personalities, self-efficacy, gender and participation in jazz, music performance anxiety, minority populations in the workplace, attitudes towards jazz and jazz improvisation, the sex stereotyping of musical instruments, amongst other topics. Uh, looking at some of the women studies on women in non-traditional careers, it was Cantor who devised a theory of minority groups, uh, ranging from uniform, where everybody is uniform, skewed, tilted, and balanced populations. For my study, women in jazz tend to fall in a skewed minority group, which is a skewed population of 15% of participants compared to a majority population of 85. Lemkow defined, excuse me, Lemkow's study uh, examined personality traits and characteristics of women in male-dominated occupations. 
and she found women in those studies were high on competency traits, they had great emotional health and coping skills, they were not moody, they were independent, assertive, and rational, had high family stability growing up, and parents who encouraged androgynous play. Spangler, Gordon, and Pipkin investigated the presence of tokens, these minority token individuals in majority populations, and found that tokens are highly visible, overly observed, and often felt disproportionate performance pressure. Studies on sexual harassment and discrimination in jazz, uh, Alexander's 2011 dissertation uh, described how jazz women experienced sexually tinged requests, degrading jokes about women in female-led bands, and were made to feel uncomfortable because of sexually suggestive gestures. Reese's study on jazz women uh, found that women were presumed to have ulterior motives rather than professional reasons for conversing with their male colleagues. They felt inhibited and uncomfortable around male musicians. The literature on the sex stereotyping of musical instruments, many of the music ed folks are familiar with Abelese and Porter's extensive studies. Uh, what was important for me in my research was the finding that drums and brass instruments, specifically trombone and trumpet, are st stereotypical masculine instruments, and saxophone was consistently found to be gender neutral. I did a study in 2012 leading up to the dissertation process looking at sex, instrument choice, and participation in jazz in middle school, high school, and collegiate bands. And in my study, I found the saxophone was played by 40%. 40% of the college students that were playing saxophone were female. So that is in line with Abelie's and Porter's study. Drums and bass at the middle school level was played exclusively by male students. So we do have more continued sex stereotyping of instruments. And then Carol's study on sisters in jazz. There were 20 participants from the sisters in jazz competition. Um, she found that many of the women did not experience st sex stereotyping of their musical instruments during their formative years. They had supportive parents and mentors. Self-efficacy studies. I found two studies in jazz relating to self-efficacy and improvisation. But I wanna first start with Bandura's definition he describes self-efficacy as the conviction that one can successfully execute the behavior required to produce the outcome. So it was Siorma's 2009 study on self-efficacy and jazz improvisation. He found that self-efficacy had a large indirect effect on jazz improvisation achievement. However, Watson's 2010 study found the opposite. That study found no significant relationship between self-efficacy and jazz improvisation and jazz improvisation achievement. Looking at sex differences in music performance anxiety, uh, Spielberger defines state anxiety as a transitory emotion characterized by physiological arousal and consciously perceived feelings of apprehension, dread, and tension. And I focus on state anxiety because jazz improvisation anxiety is a state that one is in for a specific period of time. Where Flowers conducted a study that looked specifically at this issue in 2006. The results of this study showed that females uh, were significantly less confident, more anxious, and had poorer attitudes towards learning jazz improvisation. They were less willing to attempt improvisation, and they lacked the confidence to try more difficult improvisation tasks. The results also showed that differences in confidence, anxiety, and attitudes towards jazz improvisation could be attributed to sex. I will add a quick note though, where Flowers also found males experienced improvisation anxiety, but not to the debilitating levels that the female participants expressed. Looking at sex and participation in jazz in general, Barber's 1999 study found female participation in high school jazz bands to be around 26%. And though fewer females than males play in jazz bands, this study showed that since fewer females play jazz instruments, by instrument, their representation was about equal to that as it was in concert band. Steinberger's 2001 study on gender and participation at jazz festivals, again, she found 30% female participation at jazz festivals in these jazz bands. Males took disproportionately high number of improvised solos. Then my study a, couple, a few years later, I looked at junior high, high school, and collegiate bands at jazz festivals. 
And you can see the decreasing numbers of female participation as the level of music gets harder, females tend to decrease in number. Into my qualitative methodology now. I did do a pilot test phase. I developed the Jazz Instrumentalist Questionnaire Female, uh, and this was a pilot questionnaire that had 34 items, mostly Likert type statements where I asked participants to rate their strength of agreement from one, being strongly disagree with the statement, to six, they strongly agree with the statement. Biographic data, which was nominal and categorical in data in nature, was also collected. And I also asked par participants to rank 16 different personality traits. And I wanna add a little note that all of the Likert type items left room for participants to write their own comments if they had a thought they wanted to share. I used a combination of positive and negative statements to avoid bias in the language, and I pilot tested this between April and August 2013 on five female current and recently graduated instrumental jazz studies majors at IU. Participants each took the survey twice with four to six weeks intervening, uh, and then I ran Pearson uh, for test, retest, reliability, and I found strong positive correlations for each of the five pilot participants with significance beyond the .001 level. After that, I revised the survey by combining a few of the personality traits for clarity, and I did add two screening questions at the very beginning, which would ensure that only females, and then only females meeting my certain degree requirements were able to complete the survey. My final, once I had the survey exactly how I wanted it, Invitations to participate in the survey were sent to universities from across the country to recruit female participants. I selected the schools from Downbeat Jazz Education Guide 2011-2012, as well as personal contacts. 68 schools were contacted and responses came from 22 schools. After that, I ran descriptives in SPSS to get an idea of central tendencies. Some of those mean scores will be presented here today. And then I ran Spearman's Row for correlations on items within each research question and for correlations between each research question's items. I'll be presenting some of those strongest correlations here. I would like to add, you do have a complete listing of my tables. There are 20 of them, and most of them we will hit on, but not all. Uh, data was gathered on eight different paradigms. I had statements about when students started to play jazz, what kind of family support they had growing up, issues related to sexual harassment and discrimination, competition in the jazz field, the, minor the minority status of being in the jazz field, knowledge of other jazz women in history, and their thoughts on improvisation. I wanna move now into my qual qualitative methodology. I selected four people to participate in interviews and observations. I used criterion-based selection because I wanted four women on different instruments but I also wanted them to have made interesting comments that needed further exploration on the survey, so I was looking for a high level of detail in those comments that indicated to me a more careful thought process. I wound up with a drummer who was a recent graduate from a state university along the mid-Atlantic coast, a baritone saxophonist who was a junior at a state university in the Midwest, a trumpet player who was a second year international master's student at a state university in the Northeast, and fourth, a tenor saxophonist who was a recent graduate from a master's program on the West Coast. I conducted interviews and observations over a period of months. Two of the folks who were currently still enrolled in their program were interviewed in person. One person was interviewed via Skype. She had recently graduated. And then I had a fourth participant who had also recently graduated but was on a cruise ship in Mexico. <laughs> And we, for about three weeks, we went back and forth trying to Skype, trying to FaceTime, and in the end, I emailed the bulk of my questions to her. She downloaded and responded that way, although we did have some verbal face-to-face -face Skype contact. The two individuals who were currently enrolled in school were also observed when I went to the universities. I conducted direct observations, took field notes, and video recorded. Uh, the interview questions fell into two categories. I had universal questions that I asked of all four participants, and then I had individualized questions where I really wanted to follow up or probe a little bit deeper on something that had come up in their survey response. 
This uh, semi-structured interview process took place between February and April of 2014. After I got all my data, I transcribed them into a Word document, and then I began my coding process. I took the code coding process from Saldana's The Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers. I coded each line of all the interviews by hand, and I did the same thing with the comments that came from the surveys. I used simultaneous coding when the data suggested more than one code could be applied to that particular line. I used descriptive coding when I could capture the essence of that line by just one word. And then sometimes I used in vivo coding when I wanted to preserve the voice of the participant or extract a direct quote. I devised my own color coding system in Excel to sort and regroup and shuffle around, and I eventually wound up with some themes that we will be getting to momentarily. Going back to my quantitative results, I didn't really know who I was going to get or what they would look like. I uh, wound up with 40 females who were currently enrolled or who had recently graduated from undergraduate or graduate instrumental jazz degrees. Uh, the biographical data, responses came in from 16 states across the country. They ranged in age from 18 to 57 years, although women 22 years or younger constituted over 57% of my participants. Some of them were uh, currently enrolled freshmen and it went all the way through second year master's students and then those who had graduated from those programs. One individual started playing jazz as early as fourth grade and two of my participants started playing jazz when they were in college, one of whom went to an all girls boarding school and had never played jazz in, in really outside of her private lessons. Looking at some notable means, this is where I'm gonna kind of breeze through my tables uh, just a reminder, I had students, I'm sorry, I had participants rate statements strongly disagree with one to strongly agree with six. So some of these notable means. Faculty respect my abilities as a jazz player. This is from table one. I have had strong male mentors or role models in jazz. My family supported my jazz-related activities growing up. These all had means over five, which meant they strongly agreed to these statements. They also agreed that they enjoyed improvising in a variety of styles. In table three, the statement, I prefer to blend in and be treated as one of the guys. That was a five out of six. They definitely agreed to want to be treated as one of the guys. And then from table four, in terms of attitudes towards jazz improvisation mean scores, the statement, improvising well, raises my confidence to improvise on another tune. On another tune. Again, a mean score over 5.0. Personality traits was a little bit different. I asked participants to rank personality traits. I had a series of adjectives, one through 14. One being the, their, I'm sorry. Um, one being their weakest trait, 14 being their strongest personality trait. And, and the result was fun. Uh, the women agree that they are reliable, independent, and imaginative. In fact, being reliable figured in the top three traits for 60% of respondents. Being independent, was a top one in the top three traits for over 50% of the respondents. Being imaginative was in the top three traits for over 40% of respondents. So while they are very reliable, independent, and imaginative, they are not moody. <laughs> that was in the bottom three traits for over 65% of the women who were self-describing personality traits. After I ran the descriptives and I got an idea of picture of what the jazz women looked like, I started with the correlation procedures. I ran Spearman's row, first to look for relationships between uh, items within a research question. And in table six, uh, analysis, is analysis of the experience variables, there was a positive correlation between faculty respect my abilities as a jazz player and my peers respect my ability as a jazz player. Correlation of 0.59 on that. There was also an inverse correlation between the faculty respect my abilities as a jazz player and faculty have made me uncomfortable due to sexual harassment or discrimination. So that's what we would expect to find. Looking at table seven and self-efficacy variables, most of those items were positively intercorrelated. The strongest though was between being an, a competent and competent competent and confident improviser and enjoying improvising in a variety of styles. That had a significant correlation of 0.67. Look 
looking at Table 9, Attitudes Towards Jazz Improvisation. It was, I frequently, I worrying about embarrassment while improvising and the interference of nerves on my ability to improvise. Those two things were positively correlated. Looking at Table 10 and Personality. Now, I definitely expected to find strong correlations uh, due to the nature of the dichotomous or synonymous adjectives that I use. But some of the more interesting correlations came in unexpected places. And one of them was being a risk taker and being imaginative. That was strongly positively correlated. So too was being imaginative and assuming a, le a leadership role in combos. And I kind of linked these two positive correlations as the asset of being imaginative. Being imaginative is an asset in improvisation, which might partially explain why those individuals who see themselves as imaginative tended to describe themselves as enjoying improvising um, because they're also risk takers. Being imaginative is also an asset in combos because it can help a leader arrange music for the group or even compose original music for that combo. Correlations now between research questions. Attitudes towards the jazz field and attitudes towards jazz improvisation in Table 11, I found some strong inverse correlations between I am usually relaxed before a performance or a gig and nerves interfere with my ability to improvise. Also a, an identical inverse correlation between being usually relaxed before a performance and worrying about improvise, worrying about embarrassing themselves while improvising. In Table 12, Attitudes Towards Jazz Improvisation and Self-Efficacy, the interference of nerves on the ability to improvise was inversely correlated with all self-efficacy items. And if you look at Table 12 also, worrying about embarrassing self uh, while improvising was significantly correlated with each of the self-efficacy items, although some were positive and some were negative. In Table 13, Attitudes Towards the Jazz Field and Self-Efficacy, being relaxed before a performance and gig was positively correlated with having difficulty recovering from a bad solo. And this was a surprising positive correlation for me, but I think it might partially be due to some of the language that I used in the statement because I used a qualifying word. I, I wrote the statement, I am usually relaxed right before a concert or gig, and that might make it hard for participants to strongly agree or strongly disagree when you use qualifying language like that. In Table 15, uh, some strong inverse correlations, inverse relationships between attitudes towards the jazz improvisation and experience. Peer respect kind of dominated this. Participants who believed they had the respect of their peers didn't tend to worry about embarrassing themselves while they were improvising. Women who said, my peers respect my abilities as a jazz player didn't report so much that nerves interfered with their ability to improvise. And looking at table 16, attitudes towards the jazz field and experience, uh, there's a positive correlation, moderately strong, between males receiving more improvisation opportunities than did the females, and working twice as hard. And this to me indicated that the more strongly a woman, or the women felt that males received opportunities to improvise that they weren't getting, the more they felt they had to work twice as hard. And then looking at table 19, experience and self-efficacy variables. Again, peer respect dominated right here. The women who said, my peers respect my abilities as a jazz player were more confident, competent improvisers. The women who said, my peers respect my abilities also tended to enjoy challenging improvisation more than others did. So that's the bulk of my correlations. After I got through all the survey data, I started looking, started the qualitative portion of my study, and now I'm going to go over some of the themes that I unearthed. I discovered, put together two themes after I got through the coding process. The first was called Unique Aspects of the Female Jazz Instrumentalist Experience. This brought together code words such as sex, sexual harassment, expectations, sexual expectations, reactions, a whole bunch of codes fell into this one theme. Participants told me about a lack of female role models. They were not able to name very many female jazz instrumentalists, either in the interviews or even while taking my online survey. 
I heard quite a bit of discussion on sexual harassment. It came in verbal and physical forms. An extreme case was exemplified by one of the women that I interviewed. Um, she actually ended up leaving a full tuition scholarship after her junior year because sexual harassment was so bad, she dropped out of school, went on to graduate elsewhere. Uh, participants reported unwanted physical contact in terms of fellow musicians who drank too much on a gig, sometimes faculty members who lingered too long. One participant reported attempted rape. Uh, verbal harassment in the form of that's what she said jokes and other instances of sexual innuendo designed to make the woman feel uncomfortable, usually in a combo setting is where this was happening. Uh, the woman also discussed expectations, lower expectations, feeling prejudged, being underestimated by audience members, bandmates, faculty members. On one survey, a woman wrote, when I auditioned for, institution name removed, both instructors admitted that they weren't expecting much out of me. I heard that male peers didn't view the women as much of a threat. They weren't viewed as heavy players. The baritone saxophonist that I interviewed said she knew she wasn't pressured to work as hard as her male peers were. The teachers were not very demanding of her. She ended up uh, babysitting for the jazz chair for an entire semester taking care of his child. And that led to less time for her to practice on her instrument. And then she said, then I'm sitting in band wondering why I'm not getting any solos. Um, and she thought that it had a lot to do with being viewed kind of as a motherly caregiver and not a hard-hitting Barry sax player that she wanted to be viewed. Participants talked about not only un being underestimated, but underestimating other women. And uh, three of them admitted to this. And uh, one said, you know, when I see another woman walk onto the gig, I think, I hope she doesn't stink. Although those weren't her exact words. Um, <laughs> Women are harder on other women than even men are, I believe. And I think that has to do with they've worked so hard to earn that respect that they, they are fearful of another woman coming in that is less than or that doesn't live up to that standard. Also, sexual expectations, the presumption that a woman playing a stereotypical masculine instrument is a lesbian, expectations for sex being misinterpreted that their interactions with male peers indicate that they're attracted, not just conducting business trying to recruit someone for a gig, and also surprised reactions to their playing. My second theme that I unearthed was jazz improvisation. Women talked about unequal solo distribution in big bands, and they described it as the bro show. I also got a lot of negative attitudes towards jazz improvisation. Words like hesitant, timid, devastating, struggle, disappointed, and avoid were used to describe the women's interactions with jazz improvisation. I sensed a real lack of confidence. I saw women stepping aside in combo rehearsals, letting somebody else take the first solo. Uh, they avoided improv Im improvising in some instances and expressed frequent dissatisfaction with their solos. In terms of anxiety, that was described as one of the biggest hurdles for the jazz women in both the survey comments and in their interviews. Now this improvisation anxiety is a type of state anxiety. It's just a momentary thing. They linked it to the music itself. Fast tempos, difficult key signatures, difficult changes, open tunes with little or no structure. One woman in her interview, the trumpet player said, I don't feel smart enough to play that kind of music when it's just open and free. Uh, unfamiliarity with the tune, the size of the band, and playing with new musicians or unfamiliar musicians was also an issue uh, that figured into jazz improvisation anxiety. So let me pull this together. What does all of this mean? Kind of bringing together the numerical data and then the surveys and, and the interviews. The nature of the female jazz instrumentalist experience, peer respect dominated the correlational data. Women who felt uh, their peers respected their abilities were more confident and competent improvisers. They worried less about embarrassing themselves. It was positively correlated with having faculty respect and receiving, it was inversely, it was an inverse relationship with receiving harassment or experiencing harassment from peers and faculty. In the interviews and in the survey comments, being excluded and, and underestimated were two prevalent themes. There was a great desire to be considered part of the group. Women also, of course, were uh, reported underestimating other jazz women, as I just mentioned. Discrimination and sexual harassment were part of the experience. Sexually tinged jokes or innuendo, inappropriate touching, attempted rape, 
ask, being asked for sexual favors in exchange for access to event tickets. And in one instance, for the woman who left her degree program, a faculty member asking other jazz students what they thought she would be like in bed. Undue interest in a woman's sexual relationships, and another participant in her survey reported that she had a teacher who never learned her name. One of the jazz faculty just always called her sweetie honey baby, but she never had a name. And they also reported a, a severe lack of female role models. Um, looking at the extent of self-efficacy in jazz, the participants reported a moderate level of self-efficacy and having difficulty recovering from a bad solo was also positively correlated with the interference of nerves and high pressure performances making participants markedly more nervous than rehearsals. Again, peer respect and confidence and competence in improvising positively correlated. Uh, attitudes towards jazz interference, improvisation anxiety, and the interference of nerves on improvising dominated this data. Uh, women frequently worried about embarrassment, um, but those who didn't worry about embarrassment were the ones who felt they had the respect of their peers. In terms of attitudes towards the jazz field, strong preference for being treated as one of the guys. They want to be uh, viewed as part of the group. Uh, they reported uh, certainly they did have more male friends than female, and one wrote in her comments, seriously, it's weird. I had other participants that I interviewed say they had never thought about it before, but they certainly did have far more male friends. They were more comfortable around males than they were around females. When it came to personality, as I mentioned before, the women found themselves to be very reliable, independent, and imaginative. They were not moody. <laughs> An interesting finding was being task-oriented was inversely correlated with jam session participation. And I think this results from the informal, unstructured, unpredictable nature of a jam session. If you are someone who focuses on a task and you cannot control when you get called up to play the jam session, what tune is called, what the tempo, what key, if you're taking a solo, when your solo will come, that's not going to appeal to someone who's so task oriented. They're not gonna wanna get up or participate in jam sessions much. And then the second finding on personality, uh, the women who said they have more male friends than female friends reported less enjoyment of the com competitive aspects of jazz improvisation. And this might have to do with those who want to be treated as one of the guys and blend in, might not want to focus on competing with them. Because in the interviews, it became very clear they want to be part of the jazzer group and be invited out to be part of the jazz hang. So before I wrap up here, uh, what are some of the implications of my study? Implications in terms of curriculum. Include female jazz instrumentalists in history courses, not just the singers and pianists. Analyze big band arrangements and compositions by female composers. Maybe include recordings by female instrumentalists in the listening repertoire for private lessons or transcriptions for improvisation classes. In essence, I'm saying normalizing women as part of the jazz narrative. In terms of pedagogy, we know improvisation anxiety is experienced by many of the women, and I'm not at all saying males don't experience that because I'm sure they do. Um, but improvisation anxiety could be addressed, strategies for addressing that could be done in lessons. Awareness of solo distribution among all students in big band, particularly focusing on giving impro improvisation opportunities to jazz majors, making sure all jazz majors get those opportunities. And a third implication in terms of curriculum, uh, pedagogy, I mean, excuse me, improvisation, open it up, teach it at the younger levels. So that at the middle school level, we don't get into jazz, but I say, oh my goodness, no music? What am I supposed to do? Um, making improvisation an aspect of music education so that by the time they get to jazz, it's, oh, that's cool, let's try it. Uh, in terms of education, hold women to the same high standards as the male students. View female students just as competent as their male peers and have the same expectations, no special treatment. Being aware of gender language, I heard from several people being told, oh, you need to man up or grow a pair. Um, and then gendered language, nicknames, sweetheart, those types of things, just an awareness of that. And then we need more women teaching jazz at the collegiate level, because uh, I think exposure to professional jazz women as guest artists and clinicians at festivals will help shift the perception that there are no female jazz instrumentalists or the perception that women cannot be successful making a career in jazz. 
uh, some ideas for improvements to my study. Uh, attrition was a bit of an issue for me. 70 participants met, 70 people met the requirements and they started my survey, but only 40 got all the way to the very end. So one thing I could do is make it shorter. Another idea would be to take, to not ask for the personal information like their name and email address. I collected that because I needed to ask four of them to be in my interview population. Uh, I would love to have had a larger sample so that I might be able to do uh, factor analysis. And certainly having a larger sample, even if I don't reach 100, would give me a more generalizable result. Uniformity in the qualitative procedures, a weakness in my interview process was the fact that I didn't get to exchange questions back and forth and, and comment with the one participant on the cruise ship. Uh, so if I could have had that be a little bit more uniform. And then also using qualifying words in my like or type statements made it difficult for participants to strongly agree or disagree. And those words were words like often, frequently, usually, sometimes. And then lines of additional inquiry going forward. Sexual androgyny was alluded to in the surveys and the interviews, and it would be fun to add uh, elements from the BEM sex role inventory to a study such as this. Also looking at the trait of per perfectionism and how that affects satisfaction with improvised solos. We could certainly apply methods for studying music performance anxiety on jazz improvisation anxiety. It'd be interesting to conduct case studies on collegiate instrumental jazz programs with different populations, those that have a more balanced population and then those that have a more skewed population with only one or two female jazz majors. And then there's certainly a need to conduct the same systematic research on male jazz instrumentalists, as well as studies on homosexual jazz musicians is not nearly non-existent, and studies on race and participation, there are voids there. And before I, I close, I want to end with a, a wonderful statement I heard last spring on NPR from a podcast. It, it said this, if you think the reason there aren't women in the Jazz at Lincoln Center band is because there aren't skilled women who could play in it, you are wrong. If you think you haven't heard of a woman who plays, insert instrument, as well as man who plays same instrument, because she doesn't exist, you are wrong. If you think the paucity of women in jazz can be traced to decades of sexism and women being discouraged from, for years from doing anything but singing, you are right. And if you don't know women who play jazz today, that's your fault, and that's the system's fault, not the fault of those women. Become educated and then work for a system that's better than the one we have.